So if we talk from a purely functional perspective, uh, whenever people live in the world, it's always difficult to live life. Life is never easy. And suppose we are going on a journey, then if we are carrying some baggage, now we would want to carry as less bag as possible. Of course, we will be tempted to carry a lot. But if it is we who have to literally carry it, then we will think, uh, if we don't have any a trolley or any porter, then we'll try to cut down our baggage as much as possible. So if we consider a journey across, across generations, then people, at least at the physical level, life was much tougher than it is now. Even to get some simple water to drink or to get fire, we had to work so much physically. So at that time, if something, if some stories some book, some wisdom has been preserved by people for generation upon generation, for century after century. And it must have had some serious value for those people. The human mind can come up with so many stories. The Now writing books is easy, but still, even if books were not writing or not easy, still spinning up stories is not difficult. Anybody can come up with a story. And Sometimes even that person forgets the story after some time. They themselves don't remember what story they had it. There was a poet, he would, uh, America, he's a European, uh, British poet, and he would write very complex poetry. And in moments of insight, he'd write a poetry, write a poem, and then the British Royal Society was, they liked his poem, and poem called, his name was Browning, and his poem was Sardella, I wanted to give an award for that. And they found that you know, one particular passage in the poem was very difficult to understand. So then they said, we want to reward this poem, award this poem, but can you explain what you mean by this? And then he read it once, and he read it a second time, and then he read it a third time. And then he said, when I wrote this, God and I knew the meaning. Now only God knows the meaning. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes we may write some things which even we may forget what I what did I mean by it. So, many times, sometimes we tell a story and then at the end of the story, what was the moral of the story? What was the point of the story? Yeah, I just remember the story. It becomes like that. So, if something has been remembered, something has been replicated, it must have had some serious value for people. So even if we don't consider from a, a devotional perspective, we don't consider from a religious perspective, we simply say consider from a rational human perspective. Uh, the stories from the past which have been preserved for thousands, hundreds and thousands of years, they must have contained something because of which they survived. Why did people choose to remember them, replicate them, teach them to the future generations? That's because they offered some value. Now, what is the value that the Bhagavatam offers? So here, <clears throat> I'll try to view two subjects together to talk about the relevance of the Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. And this may, the, the main theme will be the glory of the Bhagavatam, but I'll try to view it with another angle about the relevance. See, why do bad things happen to good people? This is a question which everyone has. Recently I was in Canada and one small boy, maybe six year old boy came and he asked me, why do bad things happen to good people? So now whenever somebody asks that question, especially in the one-to-one -one meeting, I, I don't answer it at a philosophical level. First, what, what, what bad thing do you have in mind? Without that I cannot answer. So what happened? So he said, no, today morning I was eating my biscuit and my milk. When I put the biscuit in my milk, the biscuit fell into the milk. <laughs> so, at this age, I lost my biscuit. <laughs> That's a bad thing happening to a good person. <laughs> so, that is a question which everyone has. Why do bad things happen to good people? And there are different ways in which the answers can be given. 
Now, karma is one answer. And the Bhagavatam acknowledges that but doesn't emphasize that. The Bhagavatam speciality is that what it stresses is not why do bad things happen to good people, but what do God, what do good people do when bad things happen to them? And it gives us stories across uh, millennia of bad things happening to good people. And then how do they respond? So the central narrative is that itself. Parikshit Maharaj is not just a good person, he was a great person. He was protecting dharma, he was serving competently. And then what happened? Just for one small mistake, he was cursed to die. It was in today's term, you know, give capital punishment. And for what? It just it, it disrespected some sage a little bit. It had no malicious intention, it was just circumstantial. Now he could have railed against destiny and the unfairness of it all, but he did not. But still, even though he had that grace to renounce the world and focus on the Bhagavatam, focus on just transcendence, but still what happens is that for all of us, there is a, when we start following a particular path, there is an expected response that we are meant to have. There is an expected way we are meant to behave. And even though we, uh, we may be broken inside, but we often try to act strong. Now, it's, not a, it's not a facade. We also want to become strong. But... There can always be when something terrible happens to someone, some amount of resentment, some amount of anger, some amount of disheartenment. None of this comes out in Parikshit Maharaj's speech. He is very graceful. But it, what Srimad Bhagavatam does, what Shukdev Goswami does through the various stories of the Srimad Bhagavatam is tell Parikshit Maharaj that you are not alone in your suffering. And it's one thing, say, if everybody is healthy. It's a, uh, say, if all of you are supposed to go for a, maybe Yatra to India or to New Vrindavan or somewhere like that. And one of you falls sick with fever. And you feel everybody is going and I am not going. And you feel especially miserable. And especially then, if they go there and on Facebook they put photos of how they are going and then you see them and you feel even more miserable by that. Hmm? But suppose... You are going somewhere and then you find that there is an epidemic and everybody is sick. Then it is not that we want others to be sick. But what we want is we don't want to be suffering alone. So it is best if nobody suffers. But if, if I am suffering, then why should I be singled out? That is what we feel. So what Parikshit Maharaj is shown throughout the Bhagavatam is that you are not alone in your suffering. And there have been others also suffered and they also suffered just as unjustly as you have. And look at how they responded. Can you think of some stories in the Bhagavatam which talk about this theme of characters suffering unfairly? Dhru Maharaj. Yeah. The five-year-old boy, just the natural desire of a child to sit on his father's lap. <coughs> He was rejected, he was neglected by his father and he was severely criticized by his stepmother. Then we have Prahlad Maharaj. He was the one who is meant to be the natural protector of a child that was attempting to assassinate him. Why? What's going on? So, how could anyone do like that? It's like, okay, somebody curses you to die in seven days. But to have your own father wanting to kill you, it's, un it's unconscionable. So, who else? Pandavas, of course, their whole story is of suffering. Any other characters? Subhadra. Oh, her son. Yeah, this is Mahabharat, but, as, but yeah, it's not. What are the central stories in the Bhagavatam? I'm not talking about general scripture stories. Gajendra, okay. Yeah, you are just having a cool time and suddenly life became very hot. 
<laughs> so yes chitra ketu and he was he had no malice in his heart just astounded at seeing uh, shiva and parvati together uh, she, uh, and he laughed he was cursed for that cursed to become a demon then apart from that nachiketas that's the oblations that's the oblations there okay yeah so one important so you could say ambarish maharaj isn't it he does not he is he just is fasting and then a sage comes and he just drinks some water and the sage wants to have him burned cursed for that and if you consider that even krishna's own life even before he is born somebody is out to kill him so we see that time and time again this is the same thing and through all this the theme is that how do all these great people respond when bad things happen to them so with this this broad story line let's put this verse which i discussed shrimad bhagavatam puranam amalam yad vaishnavanam priyam puranam amalam so puranam amalam means this is pure spotless knowledge now what do we mean by pure knowledge over here you could say that sometimes uh, the impure the word impure so the opposite of pure could be impure or uh, but we could say the opposite of pure is contaminated or the opposite of pure can also be diluted hmm? contaminated means that it is no longer healthy but diluted means like if somebody has given strong medicine in those they can't take it then you dilute the medicine so The, the both these the various scriptures that are there in the vedic canon and outside the vedic canon they often give an impure understanding of life it is in the sense of contaminated or diluted depending on your perspective what is this impure understanding uh, there was one <clears throat> philosopher you could call him philosopher <laughs> not so he he full of why because he just he was nihilistic completely rejecting all all traditional values traditional wisdom and he said if we actually just take our blinkers off if somebody thinks seriously about the nature of life it's it's very gloomy he said that existence is suffering therefore the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow and now we may say what kind of uh, depraved mentality this is but actually it's if we just look at the naked reality of life you know distress can attack us in so many different ways and you know, why should we live life has so much suffering in it that we need some sense of me- meaning meaning to make that suffering worthwhile and especially in the modern or you could say now the post modern times where all grand narratives are neglected rejected there is no god there is no other world so why should i, why should I go through all this life so uh, the, the existence is suffering this is a defining reality now we might we might numb ourselves to this reality by many many distractions entertainment or even our occupations and but that remains the reality that existence is suffering now the impure knowledge or the, you could say impure in the sense of contaminated or diluted is that okay existence is suffering but by various material means you can mitigate that suffering so material means could be oh you 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 worship god there's dharma artha kama and moksha comes gradually so you worship god and then you will have the good life god will bless you with wealth god will you best bless you with a good family and you will live happily that is a good life now yes certainly worshiping god and living religiously is much better than rejecting god and living religiously definitely no doubt but still ultimately 
whether we are religious or irreligious, death doesn't discriminate. Death takes everyone away. So, the religious scriptures which talk about how by, by living religiously, you can live happily in this world. They, the Bhagavatam says, they are, they are diluted. So, the Bhagavatam doesn't do this. It's Amala Puran means, it doesn't say that you worship God and you'll be happy in this world. Now, of course, by worshipping God, we will be happier than what we would be otherwise. But that doesn't mean, it's like, that just because we are happier, doesn't mean we are happy. Just because if somebody is very sick and they are healthier than what they were earlier, doesn't mean they are healthy. So, life has lots of distresses. And now this is not a pessimistic view of life, it is a realistic view of life. Hmm? And this is not, again, I will, as we move forward, it's not meant to create gloom and doom. But the idea is, the Bhagavatam does not varnish the truth. And there is a contextual as well as the eternal reason for this. The contextual reason is that Shrimad, that Shrimad Bhagavatam is spoken to Parikshit Maharaj, who has decided to embrace death now. That has come and he is not trying to counter it. So then for that purpose, it's told to him, don't, don't distract yourself. Just focus on transcendence. Focus on the world beyond. And that, the Bhagavatam says how it is only by worshipping the Lord, by, by making ourselves attached to the one who exists beyond the bad and beyond the good of the world, that we can get relief from the world, that we can get release from the world. So this pure knowledge that ultimately this world has to be transcended. No material means can improve things in this world. Dukhaushadam tadapi dukham atadhyaham Bhuman brahmami vadame tavadasya yogam Another verse in the Prahalad's prayers which actually summarizes the nature of material existences this one Yasma priya priya viyoga sanyoga janma shokagnina sakala yoni shudayyamana That he says we all want that which is dear to us priya We want the priya and that which is a priya, which is, which is unlikable, we want to be away from it. We want union with the likable and we want separation from the unlikable. But life does the opposite. We have union with the like, unlikable and separation from the likable. And because of this, we are all in distress. Look, but the worst thing is, is when there is union with the likable, that often causes even greater distress. When we get what we want and we get attached to it and then we lose it. So Harsha, the story of Chitra Ketu and Harsha Shok is that he got a son and then he lost even greater distress. Dukh aushadam tad api dukham. So the Bhagavatam's mood is that material solutions ultimately will not work. And therefore, this is Prahalad playing the Narsimha Dev. Bhuman brahmami vadame tavadasya yogam. My dear Lord, I have wandered in this material existence for a long time trying to get the likable, trying to avoid the unlikable, but now I understood it is pointless. So now, please instruct me, how can I serve you? So amid the likable, the unlikable, whatever it is, I want to serve you. Vadame tavadasya yogam. And that is the same mood of the Bhagavatam. So it's amala in the sense that, that now, it's, it's pure, it's uncontaminated, it's undiluted. Now, most people will not be able to take this undiluted. So, existence is suffering. I, I, I can't accept that. It's not true. Yeah, it, it's not always true. But eventually, existence gravitates towards more and more suffering. As we grow old, as we get diseased, and ultimately as we die. So, this is not... Uh, so, so, for those who cannot take that, then there are scriptures which dilute the dose. And they say, yeah, you do this, your life will be better. You do this, your life will be better. And yes, it will be better, but if, unless one is devoting oneself to God, there is no ultimate solution. So this is a pure amalam. And then, the second line was, so what was the acronym we are discussing? Pure. So, understanding. pure understanding of uh, renunciation. renunciation and ecstasy. ecstasy. Yes, thank you. So, so first line is pure. Srimad Bhagavatam Puranam Amalam Yad Vaishnavanam Priyam. Second line is, yes, min param hamsyam ekam amalam. 
परम एकम अमलम ज्ञानम परम गीयते दैट दिस इज द नॉलेज दैट इज चेरिश्ड एंड सांग बाय द परमहंसा दिस इज देयर अंडरस्टैंडिंग नाउ परमहंसा इज अ इज अ टर्म दैट डिस्क्राइब्स ह्यूमन नेचर बाय ड्राइंग अ मेटाफर फ्रॉम नेचर सो हंसा इज द स्वान and the swan is a special bird which can take the milk separate the milk from the water so you get a contaminated thing it'll just take out the milk leave the water so paramhamsas are those who can similarly take the milk out of the water of the material world so what is the milk here the milk is the absolute truth milk is krishna so again it's not said that the world is to be rejected the world we have to see how the world can take us to krishna how the world can become a path for us to krishna so we don't accept the world but through the world we accept krishna if we accept the world we stay in the world but if through the world we accept krishna we seek krishna through the world then we go toward krishna so that is the knowledge that the bhagavatam gives us param hamsyam ekam amalam gyanam param giyate So the Bhagavatam, if you see, although it is a world transcending book in its uh, in its ultimate purpose, but it also uses the world as a tool for meditation. And broadly speaking, there are three sections in the Bhagavatam which give three different visions of the world as a tool to the Lord, to the source of the world. In the second canto, there is a description of the universal form. The third canto. there is the teaching of sankhya which kapila gives to his mother devahuti and the fifth canto there is cosmology now all these if you look at the beginning and the end of these sections it's all not the specifics are important the purpose is important that the whole idea is envision the whole universe to be like a body of the lord and by that what will happen when you look at the universe you can think of the lord so that is a the chapter over there is called the first step in god realization why because over there most people think of bigness in terms of big size if somebody is very wealthy and they are living in a small apartment they are really very wealthy so they should be living in a big house so when god is big people think of that bigness in terms of size the universe is his body hmm the mountains are his bones the rivers are like his blood vessels the lakes are like the uh, like the water in his navel or the pores from his body the the sweat coming from the pores of his body like that there are various visions given now this is this is more a conceptualization there is no there is no such place called virat rupa loka hmm there is no place where the universal form resides but it's a conceptualization when we see the world instead of forgetting the lord while look, while looking at the world we see the world and see the lord in the world so this is a first level meditation that just look at the big things in the world and remi- be reminded of the biggest being in the world now another way of looking at the world is to deconstruct the world to analyze the world okay, what is this world made up of that is done through the 24 elements analysis and sankhya but again the purpose is after we analyze the world we understand that this all this world which looks why do we need to analyze or deconstruct the purpose is the purpose is to de romanticize the world we have a romanticized idea of oh, this world is such a wonderful place this world is such an attractive place so but actually ultimately no matter how attractive something looks it is just made of earth water fire air ether if some there is a delicious halwa i hope there is no halwa after the program so i don't want to spoil your relishing of that halwa of course it's not just halwa it's it's krishna manifesting is krishna prasad manifesting as halwa but if instead of halwa uh, you will if we if we see if we see a delicacy like halwa dessert we our mouth a tongue might water but if somebody gives us some grain and some sugar and a stew and a pan and our mouth will not start watering 
if we are hungry probably our eyes will start watering when will i get some food isn't it <laughs> so when we consider a thing in terms of its components we deconstruct it its charm goes away so the world looks very attractive but it's analyzing the world in terms of its elements is a way of deconstructing it so it's of de romanticizing it but it's not just to de romanticize and it is ultimately to also divinize it that actually all these elements they themselves may not be attractive but they come from the supreme so this is uh, the understanding that you look at the world but you remember the lord these these things may look attractive but they are just combination of stuff and that stuff comes from the lord so then third meditation is on the cosmos when many people they look at the sky and they look at the stars and they wonder where did all this come from how magnificent this is so now the how the cosmos can be a tool for us to meditate on the lord there have been in indian tradition itself there have been many different models of the universe the jyotish shastras have a different model of the universe the bhagavatam has a different model of the universe and our acharyas never con- had a conflict between them it's not the bhagavatam is right and jyotish is wrong the ultimately reality is very complex all that we can get is as models of reality so the so science also offers us one model of reality the point is the bhagavatam talks about the whole universe in a way to describe how dharma and devotion pervade the universe in this loka these people are there they are worshiping that loka those people are there they are worshiping that loka they are they are worshiping so the idea is this whole universe when you look at the stars and so just think oh they are just beautiful we understand that everywhere there is there is the lord and worship is going on now prabhupada was asked once that is there life on other planets and prabhupada said obviously why would krishna waste so much space <laughs> <laughs> now through science what we can say is that life as we know it has not yet been discovered on other planets but we are not we have not uh, life as we know it is not the only life that exists or that can exist but anyway the point is this is the understanding pure understanding so pure is the idea that uh ultimately we have to transcend the world but the understanding we don't just reject the world but we connect the world in various ways with the lord and that's why the devotee is because even the devo- devoted are also living in this world so paramhamsas are those who take the milk from the water so like that they take krishna from the world right you look at the world but don't just look at the world look at krishna through the world that is a second line third line now talks about is तत्र ज्ञान विराग भक्ति सहित नैष्कर्म्यम आविष्कृता सो रिनंसिएशन वी ऑफन टॉक अबाउट युक्त वैराग्य नाउ युक्त वैराग्य इज वेरी गुड दैट एंगेज रिनंसिएशन बट वी के नॉट रियली हैव युक्त वैराग्य विदाउट हैविंग सम वैराग्य इफ यू वॉन्ट टू engage the world in krishna service engage worldly things in krishna service that's good but we have to have some attachment to krishna and we have to have some detachment from the world you may say i want to engage the world in krishna service but if you're not careful the world will engage us in maya service so we have to look at our adhikar at our level and then function accordingly so a certain amount of renunciation is required now how does renunciation come out come about there is a difference between frustration and renunciation i gave a whole class on how aversion to commitment is not detachment aversion to commitment is not detachment there are three modes there is tamas rajas and sattva ignorance passion and goodness so in passion there is attachment i want this and i want to enjoy it so say one person gets attached to somebody else and then they want to have a relationship and have some happiness in that the detachment would mean that they 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 are not so obsessed with anyone also not so infatuated someone so basically detachment is when we understand that this there is no real happiness in it or if there is any pleasure 
it's not worth the trouble. Hmm? The trouble is more than the pleasure. So that gives detachment. Hmm? Now, so detachment or renunciation, you could say. That is when I understand that the pleasure is not worth the trouble. But when there is frustration, so, uh, or if you consider aversion to commitment, aversion to commitment is where it is not that there is no pleasure here, it is that there are so many options for pleasure that I do not know which to choose. So, I will keep all the doors open. So, that is not detachment, that is not detachment at all. That is, that is such an attachment that you cannot even decide what you are attached to. Hmm? So, similarly, the difference between renunciation and frustration is everybody gets frustrated in life. Because, why? Because life is frustrating. That things don't work out the way we want them to work out. And Ismat Priya Priya Yoga Sanyoga Jamna, as I said. Now, when this frustration comes, what do we do? The Bhagavatam gives us a vision of how great souls responded. Now, Bhakti is very good. In the sense that anyone, any way they are practicing bhakti, that is good. But if somebody has vairagya while practicing bhakti, then that bhakti can move forward steadily. If you are too attached to the world, then our devotion gets shaken when there are any storms in the world. So what the Bhagavatam shows is, throughout its various stories, that how great souls were, were greatly devoted. One of the themes of the Bhagavatam is, Parikshit lived very virtuously. But there are souls who are far more virtuous and devoted than him and even they suffered. So sometimes you can try to find a specific cause. Why is this happening? But sometimes we have to just accept the generic cause. This is the nature of the world. This is the nature of the world and we just make the best out of it. Now for example, recently there was this hurricane. A hurricane was there. You can try to find out why did this hurricane come over here. Well, okay, you can try to find out maybe this, there was this atmospheric imbalance over here and this air pressure and because of that came. But ultimately, if a particular place is prone to that, it's prone to that. I was in New Zealand and I was giving a class and suddenly everybody started shaking. I said, what? And I noticed I was also shaking. I said, what happened? He says, earthquake. Earthquake? My heart started quaking. And everybody was cool. He said, no, once or twice a week we have earthquakes here. Really? <laughs> Since most of them are so small, they are so weak that nobody notices them also. Sometimes you just barely notice them. So, uh, now what is happening? Something is just the way it is. You accept it and you live with it. So, the, so when what the Bhagavatam does is, yet virag saitam. Oh, Parikshit, something similar has happened to many, many people in the past also. So, this, this is the nature of the world. Don't get too caught in specifics. There are times to look at specifics. Why did this person speak like this? What did I do that made this person do like this? So sometimes we have to analyze and learn. But sometimes, is, sometimes there's just nothing to learn over there. Just things have gone wrong and that's it. So then we just have to, we don't learn about that specific interaction, but we learn about the generic nature of the world. And virag, some amount of detachment comes up. The Bhagavatam stories are very much intended to infuse detachment. So, what is the third thing? Renunciation. The acronym is pure understanding for renunciation and ecstasy. Now, all this might seem very, as I said, very pessimistic. It's, it's very gloom inducing, you know, life is suffering, everybody has suffered. It's, it's not that, that is not the message of the Bhagavatam. The message of the Bhagavatam is a message of hope and joy. And that is described in the last line. That that shrunvan supatan vicharana paro bhaktya vimucce naraha. So when we hear the Bhagavatam, when we contemplate in the Bhagavatam, then what happens? By that paro bhaktya, devotion to the Supreme Lord comes up. The idea is that, yes, this world is a place of distress. But beyond this world is the Lord of the world. And he's not just beyond this world, he's also within our hearts. He's in this world with us. And we are meant to direct our heart toward Him. So the, the overall theme of the Bhagavatam, if you want to summarize in one sentence, it would be that greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. So, 
Parikshit Maharaj is hurt. At the body level, there is no redemption, from, no release from that. But the power to heal. Krishna raises his consciousness upwards. So now, God, Krishna is always there in our hearts, but we can't experience him. Because we are too caught with the world. We are too caught. This will make me happy. That will make me happy. That will make me happy. Now, of course, we have to do all our responsibilities and certain situations are definitely much better than other situations. So, if we can make some changes, we should. But we don't have to invest our, all our hopes and our attention in that. We focus on the, on the turning our consciousness toward the Lord. To the extent we do that, to that extent, Paro Bhaktya, the Bhagavatam reveals a vision of God which is extremely loving and lovable. So, God is talked about in different traditions in different ways. The Bhagavatam also what it does, this is a, actually I have a whole series of seminars on the structure of the Bhagavatam. So, one, one I talked about how its vision of the world, the other is its vision of God. So, first also God is like the universal form. Then God, you have these uh, huge or strange Incarnations. You have Varaha, you have you have uh, Narsamma, you have all these incarnations. But as the Bhagavatam moves forwards, its depiction of divinity also becomes more and more intimate and endearing. So Ram is again a very personal manifestation of God. And beyond that is Krishna. Krishna is the most intimate. Why is he so most intimate? Because in God, in Krishna as God, there are none of the symbols of Godhood overtly there. So God conceals his Godhood so that love can reign supreme. The Bhagavatam depicts God as a vulnerable child. As a vulnerable child, who runs in fear from his mother? Whose mother fears, oh, if I don't feed this child, he will die. There is, basically, when we have to know God, there are two aspects of God to be known. His greatness and his sweetness. His greatness brings, sub knowing the greatness about someone brings submission. Say, suppose, you know, you have, there's some devotee with whom you are discussing and there's some Bhagavatam verse. You may say, this, it means this. And you say that devotee said this means this. And just discussing, discussing, and it's going on. And then suddenly somebody tells you, actually, that devotee is not just another devotee. That devotee has studied the Bhagavatam for the last 35 years. And has done Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhava, Bhakti Saroho. Oh, really? Maybe I should hear them submissively. So knowing the greatness brings submission. Hmm? And knowing the sweetness brings affection. And devotion requires both submission and affection. So now how do we experience the sweetness of someone? It is they might be sweet to talk with, sweet to deal with. That's one way of submission. That's one way of sweetness. But a very endearing way when sweetness comes into a relationship. And this is the way we all can practice. If there is coldness in any relationship and we want warmth, we want sweetness. It is by exhibiting vulnerability. Vulnerability is a very great power which often we don't tap. The world is a tough place and it's, it's cruelly competitive and any weakness in anyone will be exploited by others. So most of us cover our weaknesses and to some extent we put on a mask in front of the world. And actually the heaviest burden is not what is carried on the back. It is what is carried on the face. Often the mask that we put on is the heaviest burden. But we all, this burden can become completely exhausting. And we need some people with whom we can be ourselves. We can put down the mask. So imagine there is some very big powerful person and they always solve everyone's problems. Any problem, you do this, you do this, you do that, they fix it. And then we also have seen them in that mode, always fixing problems. But then, say one day, they tell you, actually this problem is there, I'm very worried about this. I don't know what to do about it. Now, if we are like, a, in the, we are simply uh, 
have an idealized conception of them where we treat them, we are like a fan of them. Then what happens is we think, oh, I thought you are perfect, you are not perfect. I thought you know everything. We might be disillusioned. But if they tell it like this, actually it indicates a certain level of trust. If somebody is telling I have some problems, what does it indicate? Oh, that person trusts us and that's why they are lowering their marks before us. And then we also feel, oh, you trust me so much, then I'll try to be worthy of that trust. I will reciprocate. So generally, if you want to come close to people, it's not just by how much time we spend, but it's by how much we put down our masks. So here the same principle is applied by God. Although God is supreme and invulnerable, see, in every relationship, relationships have various dimensions to them. We want to feel respected in the relationship. We want to feel loved, cherished in the relationship. But there's another need, we want to feel needed in a relationship. We want to feel needed. If we don't feel needed, if we feel redundant, that person might respect us. But if we don't feel needed, then we feel that the relationship is not fulfilling. So, similarly, Krishna, he wants his devotees to relish the full spectrum of emotions that are there in relationships. And he wants his devotees to feel needed. And that's why he puts down his mask. Of course, for him it's not a mask. He is God. But you could say he puts on a mask. <laughs> that's why it's Yoga Maya. Yoga Maya is the illusion that increases devotion. Normally, the illusion decreases devotion. But this is the illusion that increases devotion. So he, he plays a role, he assumes a form where he acts vulnerable. And when he acts vulnerable in this way, captures the devotee's heart. So Yashoda thinks of Krishna constantly because even when he is not there, she is thinking if I don't feed him, he will fall sick. He may even die. So how can I feed him the most nutritious food? So this vision of God who, who loves to be loved, who longs for a, not the reverence of people, but the intimacy of people. That is such an endearing vision of God. That if we can understand it, we can appreciate it, we cannot but become captivated by it. So, this is the revelation of God that the Bhagavatam takes us towards. And if we hear the Leela of Krishna with this understanding of how God loves us so much, He wants to be loved and He wants us to enter into His intimate sweet circle of love, then Bhakti. Paro bhakti vimucce naraha. Our attraction to the Lord will increase, and the more the attraction to the Lord increases, the more the detachment from the world will come up. And that's how we will attain life's perfection. We'll become absorbed in the Lord. And in a sense, Parikshit Maharaj left home when he was when he was cursed and he went to the banks of the Ganga. But at the time of death, a devotee doesn't leave home. A devotee goes home. Home is not just the place, of, it's a physical structure. Home is the, the place where those whom we love stay. So for a devotee, devotee loves the Lord the most. And Parikshit Maharaj left home to go home. And that journey of leaving home for going home, leaving the temporary home, for going to the eternal home. That journey is the journey of Srimad Bhagavatam. And we all are on that journey at different stages. We might be inside our door, just peeping out, inside our home, just peeping out of a window. What else is there outside? Or we might have opened the door and started on that journey. And we are all at different stages and the Bhagavatam can empower us. Empower us with detachment and ecstasy. Ecstasy because and you understand how sweet, how absorbed the Lord is. Ecstasy is not just how high somebody dances in Kirtan. That's nice. But ecstasy is also how much one is absorbed. That, that absorption is so overwhelmingly pulling the person that they just transcend the world. So our Acharya described that through the external vision, that snake came and bit Parikshit Maharaj and his body exploded in fire. So that was like a the snake bite became like the natural funeral, funeral pyre for him. But 
Parikshit Maharaj had already left the body. By absorption in Krishna, he had already left the body. So what was burnt was not Parikshit Maharaj, his soul had already gone. So actually, did Krishna, the same Krishna who protected Parikshit in his mother's womb, why would that Krishna not protect Parikshit at the time of death? He did protect, but just in a different way. He protected by releasing his soul from the body before the body got destroyed. And that is what the Srimad Bhagavatam offers to each one of us. If we learn to treasure and cherish the Srimad Bhagavatam, not just by worshipping it, not just by keeping it in our homes, by gifting it to others, but by ourselves studying it, by appreciating its special a special devotionally potent message that it can infuse detachment and devotion in all our hearts and it can make our journey through life less stormy and eventually more successful more successful because the Bhagavatam will unite us with Krishna so I'll summarize I spoke on the theme of what is the a speciality of the Srimad Bhagavatam based on this the last one of the last five six verses in the Bhagavatam where the glory of the Bhagavatam is talked about. So I talk in terms of an acronym. Huh. What is that? Pure. pure. Pure understanding for renunciation and ecstasy. So <clears throat> if a book has been preserved for thousands of years, it must have had some value for the people who preserved it. So what was that value? And rather than dismissing these are old fashioned or irrelevant books, we need, to, we, need to preserve, we need to understand its value. And that value, especially for the Bhagavatam is, that not why do bad things happen to good people, but when bad things happen to good people, what do good people do? So pure means it's, it's not contaminated or not diluted. So most scriptures, they dilute the truth. That the world is a place of distress and they give contaminated solutions that okay when you do this things will be better when you do that things will be better and they can be better but they don't they don't offer an ultimate solution but the Bhagavatam says no this world is Dukhalaya and you have to transcend the world and often the solutions become bigger problems than the problem themselves so rather than wandering in the world trying to avoid the unlikable and gain the likable focus on the transcendent and that was pure and understanding was that the, uh, this is not just like a frustrated rejection of the world rather it's a philosophical contemplation on the world to go beyond the world so param giyate param hamsim the, the pure, it is the knowledge for the pure devotees who like the swan take the milk from the water so similarly the Bhagavatam helps us to see God in the world so we don't reject the world, but we go through the world to God. I talk about three things in the Bhagavatam. The second canto, universal form. For those who think of God in terms of greatness, that just think of him as the whole universe is his body. Then for those who are maybe too captivated by the world or those who are analytical, deconstruct the world into its elements so that it loses its, its captivating potency and then see all those elements as coming from God to again divinize the world. And then, those who look at the universe, to, to give a model of the universe that can increase, that can, that can tells us how dharma and devotion pervade the whole world, whole universe, whole existence in fact. And thus, how we can also become devoted. And then, R was renunciation. Renunciation means that we may all practice bhakti, but unless there is some amount of renunciation, there won't be much stability in bhakti. They talked about how there's a difference between frustration and renunciation. Frustration is inability to enjoy. Renunciation is disinterest in enjoying. And aversion to commitment is not detachment. So renunciation, will, renunciation means our shelter is not in Krishna. But all this might seem very world negating and life denying. But the Bhagavatam is essentially life affirming. Because it reveals such an endearing conception of God. That the, that that when we study and meditate on it, 
then what happens bhakti paro the supreme devotion the ecstasy comes up why i talk about it it gives such a lovable conception of god that god who is the supreme invulnerable exhibits vulnerability so that he can have intimacy and when we understand how lovable krishna is by cherishing the past tense the bhagavatam we become absorbed in him and thus we can go beyond this world and at the time of death parikshit maharaj did not leave home or rather he left home to go home and that is the journey for on which bhagavatam guides all of us the bhagavatam reassures us that the world the world will hurt us but greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal thank you very much granthraj shrimad bhagavatam ki jai shri bhadra purnima mahamahotsav ki jai so, do we have few time minutes for questions any questions so he had a question yesterday i'll answer that so uh, that it is said that on on bhadra purnima if we give a bhagavatam on a golden throne to someone then we will go to we will attain the spiritual world we will become liberated we will attain krishna prema so how do we understand this promise so is it that anybody who gives a bhagavatam they don't have to what does it mean they don't they didn't chant hari krishna they don't know sadhana bhakti they just automatically go back to krishna not like that see there is <coughs> scriptural promises mm-hmm. there are there is one way of taking it entirely literally and the other is to take it entirely poetically as exaggeration literally is this is what has been promised this is what has to happen and then why is this not happening to why is this not happening so uh we might have that question and take it oh it's all these people just exaggerated things well this person no it's it's in it's actually neither entirely literal nor is it entirely uh, exa- hyperbole hyperbole it is what these promises indicate the magnitude of krishna's mercy the eager dis- so the promises are expressions of the heart of krishna as manifested through his devotees and they are possibilities that krishna can be this merciful but that say whenever the lord speaks with the heart i say uh, if somebody in with great affection they say they say you know i love you so much i will do anything for you and the next the opposite person says okay put all your estate and property in my name now what you know that will be complete rasabhas is it it you are expressing affection over there and somebody so when somebody is expressing affection and the other person does calculation is it you know, then they don't have a proper reciprocation over there so the promises are expressions of the lord's heart and they should be reciprocated with our heart a compassionate heart and a calculated calculative head that is rasabhas <laughs> so a compassion when the lord's compassionate heart manifests our repentant heart should manifest our um, devoted heart should manifest what that means is that, that this is the extent to which the lord can be merciful if you look at the mood of the bhagavatam itself no there are so many places parishit maharaj is told by shukadev goswami that those if you hear the story of the killing of putana then anyone they will get love of krishna mm. or somebody who just chants like the jamal story you just chant the names of the lord once you will get liberated from all sins now parishit maharaj doesn't say hey why am i sitting down for 7 days and hearing bhagavatam i'll just chant once that's not his mood his mood so and the acharya shukdev goswami his own mood is that say for example if you consider ajamin past time there uh, in that past time uh, ajamil just chants once and he is saved from the yamudutas 
Now, what is what is Shukdev Goswami lesson over there? What he says is, that just see how merciful, how potent the name of the Lord is. That if somebody chants even once and not even intending to chant the Lord's names, if they are so much benefited, if we chant diligently, and Prabhupada is purported, if we chant diligently lifelong, then surely we will be delivered. So the mood of a, mood of a devotee is not that the devotee demands the literal fulfillment of every promise in the scripture. The devotee says, this is possible, the Lord can do it. But devotion means the devotee doesn't demand from the Lord. Rather, a devotee commits to the Lord. Devotee devotes oneself to the Lord. So, if we are demanding from the Lord, then we are demanders. We are not really devotees. So, which is also okay, at least come and come to the Lord instead of going anywhere else. But, a devotee's mood is, that this is the extent to which the mercy can come. Therefore, let me follow the process. And so, if we help Krishna in the form of the Bhagavatam to uh, come in our own house or to uh, some else's house, then that's a remarkable step forward in their spiritual journey. And if we, we have been a part of that, Krishna will help us, Krishna will bless us profusely. Now, how exactly he will bless us? That, see the souls, none of this, now we will say, if Krishna makes his promise, why can't he fulfill this promise? Then why do you say it's only a possibility, it's not a necessity? This is where we have to understand that Krishna is the supreme controller, but Krishna is not the sole controller. He is the Parameshwar, but we are also Ishwar. We are also controllers. And controllers means we all have free will. So, no scriptural promise can override our free will. Our free will is like an inviolable reality. Even God does not violate anyone's free will. So, if somebody, somebody gives a Bhagavatam and then they go back to Krishna's abode and in Krishna's abode they will ask, what's happening between India and Pakistan now? <laughs> or they will ask, what is the latest baseball score? Or, you know, what is happening here? What is happening there? If our interest is in this world, even if we go to Krishna's abode, there everybody is interested in Krishna. So we will get bored over there. So we have to develop our attachment to Krishna. So, so it's not that Krishna doesn't, Krishna doesn't want to fulfill his promise, but Krishna doesn't override our free will. So now it can happen that if we just give one Bhagavatam and we are enriched, our heart is enriched with devotion to Krishna, then that will take us toward Krishna. That one act can also take us toward Krishna if our heart is enriched with devotion. Our, if, if, even if Krishna is not the only desire of our heart, if our desire for Krishna is stronger than our desire for anything else in this world, that also will take us to Krishna. But that strengthening our desire for Krishna is something we have to do. Now when we give a Bhagavatam to the Lord, what happens to the Bhagavatam to someone? Two things happen. The Lord reveals His attractiveness more and more to us. So that if we want to, we can become more attracted to Him. And the Lord also, you could say, decreases the force of our conditionings or decreases the lure of the world. And then, we don't get so captivated by it. So the Lord can help us make the better choice. But it is for us to choose. And when we do any potent devotional activity, the Lord makes the, the wiser choice easier. But still, it is for us to make that choice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for so much So, as you said, Krishna's promises. Are the possibilities. Means it really depends upon our freedom and how much we really want to get Krishna to go to Krishna's abroad. So, is it that all the promises, because once you said, so the whole problem, we have came in, called the other time, now we have a problem, and we say, Sarah, Papa, Krishna, Krishna. 
So how to understand that all these promises? Does it really, like, like we say, it's a bank lock and key that both the keys are needed to open the lock? Right. So is it that understanding? Okay. So are Krishna's promises like a like a bank lock where you need two keys also? So Krishna's mercy as well as our endeavor. Yeah, that's a good example. There's so many promises in scripture. Let's look at some of them. Let's look at uh, one promise which Krishna repeats in the Bhagavad Gita. Or, or rather, one verse which he repeats which also has the same promise. 934 and 1865. So 934 is Man Mana Bhav Mad Bhakto Madhya Jimam Maam Evaishya Si Atmanam mat so Krishna is saying that man mana bhav, mat bhakto. There's four standard things. So fix your mind on me, give your heart to me, offer your worship and to worship me, bow down to me and offer your homage to me. And if you do this, maam evaishisi yuktvayam. If you are engaged in this way, then atmanam mat With your whole being devoted to me, then you will attain me. Maam evaishisi. So here there is a promise, Mama Vaishyasi, but the stress is Yuktvai, Vam, Atma, Na. Do all this and through all this you offer your whole being to me, be engaged in me. That's, a, that's the stress over there. And if you consider 1865, what has happened there? Manmana bhav mad bhakto madhyaji maam namaskuru maam evaishya satyam te pratijane priyosi me. Says, the first half is the same and you will come to me, that promise is also same. But here Krishna is going to be assured, satyam te. Really, you will come and assure you this is the truth. Why? Because Patijane Priyosi may declare to you that you are very dear to me. So, what is hap what is the difference between these two verses? See, it's a difference in stress. Hmm? So, for example, I will I will come to your place tomorrow. If I say that. Hmm? Now it may say. I, I will come to your place tomorrow. I will come to your place tomorrow. So, in one case it's will, that is the emphasis. In another case, I'll, I'll come to you. But in the next sense, not today, tomorrow. So, there, there can be different, so, there can be different emphasis. So, in the first 934, what is the emphasis? Krishna, say, suppose we are signing a deal. You know, say, if we are selling our house to someone, and then they say, you know, you have, to, you have to fill this form, you have to give this deal, you have to give this much money. If you do this, then if you do this, 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 then I'll give this house to you. I'll give the keys to you. I'll sign the deed in your name. Okay. Now, imagine if uh, we are desperate to sell the house. Then what will happen? We'll say, now if you do this, this, then I will do this, I will do this, I promise you I'll do this. So what is happening? In the first part, Krishna is emphasizing what we need to do. In this, in that's 934. In 1865, what Krishna is doing? Krishna is emphasizing what I will do. Now, if you do this, I promise you I'll do it. So, in a sense, Krishna is becoming desperate with compassion. He says, no, don't, don't, don't turn away, don't lose this opportunity. I promise you I'll do this. So, Krishna is also eager for us to come to him. So, yes, uh, as I said, God helps those who help themselves. So we have to help ourselves at least in a small way by, by trying to turn toward Him, by trying to develop our desire for Him. So the scriptural promises, they indicate how eager the Lord is for us to come to Him. So if the activity, basically whenever we do any devotional activity, like we hear the pastime of Krishna killing Putana or whatever, then sometimes this activity is an expression of devotion. We already have so much devotion, we express it by hearing about the Lord, by worshipping the Lord. Or sometimes it is an expression of our desire for devotion. I am not attracted right now, I don't feel my heart overflowing with love, but I want this and I will do this. So if the particular devotional activity that we are doing, it is an expression of our devotion, then the promise can, can, can come upon us immediately. But right now, when we do the devotional activity also, it's an expression of our, of our desire for devotion. And maam ichhaptum dhananjaya, Krishna says in 12.9 that, if we keep doing sadhana bhakti, atachittam samadhatum nashaknosi maistiram, 
अभ्यास योगी तो माम इच्छा तुम धनंजय आवर आवर डिजायर फॉर हिम विल बिकम स्ट्रॉगर एंड दैट हैपन्स एंड वी ऑल विल मूव क्लोजर एंड क्लोजर टू हिम थैंक यू डिजिटलॉजी दिस और दैट it is this and that our endeavor is important the idea is that if we have a little attraction we need to act on that little attraction whatever it is and the more we fan that attraction the more it will grow and it's we might take small small steps towards krishna that's also important but krishna can take giant steps towards us that means by our practice of bhakti by acting on whatever little attraction we have we become attracted to him that attraction increases but by that process the lord is pleased he reveals his attractiveness much more so it's a, it's a cumulative it's a combined process like there is a, of this is the old question what came first the egg or the chicken now of course we are vegetarians but one way of answering this question is oh, you begin with whatever you have <laughs> if you have a chicken you begin with the chicken if you have egg you begin with the egg is it it <laughs> so this is does our attraction to the lord come first or does the lord's revelation by which his beauty is revealed come first well we have to practice bhakti so begin with whatever you have okay okay yes okay Okay, so how does the impure mean contaminated and diluted both? So especially how does it mean contaminated? Okay, so generally we use the word contaminated in the sense that something that shouldn't be present is present over. Hmm? So. something is that, that, that with respect to say if we consider that the bhagavatam says that parama shreya the supreme auspiciousness is para bhakti is pure devotion to the lord now the bhagavatam may also talk about something which is less than pure devotion that is devotion that is diluted that means okay you if you cannot make god the supreme love you can make you can have some other love you can have but also love god akamah sarva kamo va moksha kamo daradi tivrena bhakti yogena yajita purusham par that that is you could say it's diluted in the sense that the full dose of serious practice even if it is not there you that be, uh, or you could put it another way that diluted is where you cannot practice intense bhakti this focus devotion love but contaminated means that there are other things there are not just pure motive but there are ulterior motives i am worshiping god so that i'll get this so that i'll get that so if we are doing some service say if if i am giving a class now the pure motive would be i just want to glorify krishna the contaminated motive could be that i want people to praise how clever i am or how devoted i am or whatever now Uh, the in this case the way to pure devotion is through contaminated devotion we can't start how can we start purely we need to first develop a relationship then we can develop a pure relationship so contaminated is not in the sense that contaminated water cannot be touched it's not like that in this case because the contaminations are there in our hearts so when the let's say the bhagavatam also talks about bhakti in the three modes goodness passion and ignorance so we cannot suddenly come towards bhakti in transcendence as long as our modes are, as long as the modes are dominating our consciousness so it's a gradual progression so contaminated means there are other motives diluted means there is not that seriousness so 
uh, we if either way if it is there that's okay we will come from either from dilution we will come to concentration or from contamination we come to purification also okay. thank you Okay. Why has Krishna given us free will? Because it causes so, so much suffering. Well, most of you probably have children. Hmm? Uh, do your children always listen to you? No. But have you ever desired, instead of a child, let me have a robot? Should simply act according to my programming. We wouldn't want that, isn't it? Actually, it is if that it will just a robot, there will be no love over there. We might treat it like a pet toy or something. But love requires the voluntarily choosing. And sometimes if you think about it, when we love someone, it is uh, not just in spite of their weaknesses or defects, it is also because of their defects. Now we can all think of, say, uh, if, if we could temporarily play God, and we could re-engineer our child to remove all weaknesses. So, okay, the child is a little tall, you make them like a giant. Hmm? The child is a little weak, you make them the next bodybuilder, make Mr. Universe or whatever. Or uh, if uh, hey, that person is not so bright, make them Al next Albert Einstein. Hmm? You, not that good looking, make them, make them like a Bollywood or Hollywood star. Now, if you remove all that is, that is, you could say, all inadequacies from the person, actually they become completely perfect and they don't need you. It is vulnerability that creates lovability. It is that, now this I am talking about in terms of attributes, but the same principle applies to free will. It is that the free presence of free will is what makes love possible. It is, free will also means, like I talked some, some inabilities I talked about, but free will also means that somebody makes some wrong choices and then we guide them toward making the right choices. That is the process of education. Now sometimes that education proceeds smoothly, sometimes it doesn't proceed that smoothly, but that's what life is. So it's a free will that makes love possible. And if Krishna had not given us free will, then you could, I, I give this example that Krishna is a supreme parent. Just as we would not want a robot uh, as a child, Krishna also doesn't want a robot as children. As though, so he wants us to love him. And yes, we have to go through the process of sometimes misusing our free will. But misuse of a thing does not make the thing bad. It is the misuse that is bad. And yes, because currently we have conditioning, so we tend to misuse the free will. But as we practice, practice bhakti and become purified, it is, uh, it is we who will be, when we learn to love Krishna, it is we who will be experiencing the ecstasy. And if we had no free will, then there would not be the ecstasy also. It's when we consciously choose to invest our consciousness in Krishna, that we get that absorption, that devotion, that ecstasy. But if you are robots, then there is no ecstasy again. Just mechanically doing what we are programmed to do. So it is out of his love for us and out of his desire that we love us. That he wants our love and he wants us to experience the ecstasy of love, of choosing to love him, that he gives us free will. Okay. So thank you very much. Gantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Tai Gaur Premanande. This is Chaitanya Prabhu Ki. Yeah.